Let's open our Bibles to Numbers chapter 17. We are going to uh, finish up the story. Uh, Really, it's a separate story unit, but it concludes the material that we looked at last week. We're going to look at chapter 17 tonight very briefly, and then we're going to move on into chapter 20. And um, just to remind you, as you're turning there, the little study guide, study schedule that we handed out several weeks ago, if you don't have a copy of that, I've got one with me tonight. Uh, We'll be looking at chapters 20 and 21. After that, chapters 22 through 25. Then chapters 26 and 27. Then chapters 31 through 36. So actually, once we jump to chapter 20 tonight, we'll be studying every chapter of the book except for chapters 29 and 30. So it's pretty easy to remember. You don't really have to have that in your mind because those are not weekly uh, groupings, those are thematic groupings, and each each group will take two or three weeks, okay? So tonight we're going to get into uh, the latter end of the book, and then that will take us through the, through the end of the, of the book of Numbers. Let's start with prayer, and then we'll read our passage and, uh, and commence with our study. Our God and Father, we are truly thankful for your love and for your kindness, for the blessings of this day, Father, and for the blessings that we enjoy in Christ. Oh God, as we look at our lives, as we look at the challenges that we face, the burdens we must carry, the temptations that overtake us, the pain that we must endure, the sorrows and disappointments that we experience, we pray, God, that we might see in those moments your grace is sufficient that you would lift our eyes above the things of this world to the things of heaven, that you would comfort our hearts, and that you would give us joy through believing in Christ. We pray, Father, that tonight our study of your word might be a respite from the storms of life, from the distractions of our day, that you would give us focus, that you would give us strength, and that through your word you would give us peace, and that you would comfort your people and build us up in the most holy faith. Bless those whom we love who could not be here tonight. Bless those who are sick. Continue to be with Ezra and Joellen, and watch over that entire family, Lord, and give them strength as they conclude this time of hospitalization. We're thankful and hopeful about that. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to be with so many in our congregation for whom we are praying regularly in their hour of need, God, that you would minister to them. Be God to us to our children, to our children's children, and draw us closer to Yourself, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Numbers chapter 17. You'll remember that chapter 16, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and On, the son of Peleth. The Lord, in a very dramatic fashion, puts an end to that rebellion. At the end of the rebellion, the very next morning, The children of Israel are accusing Moses and Aaron of killing the people of God. And the Lord sends a plague and kills nearly 15,000 of them before Aaron can get in the middle and appease the wrath of God. And so chapter 17 picks up the story in verse 1. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and get for them staffs, one for each father's house from all their chiefs according to their father's houses, twelve staffs. Write each man's name on his staff and write Aaron's name on the staff of Levi. For there shall be one staff for the head of each father's house. Then you shall deposit them in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. And the staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout. Thus I will make to cease from me the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against you. Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and all their chiefs gave him staffs, one for each chief, according to their father's houses, twelve staffs. And the staff of Aaron was among their staffs. And Moses deposited the staffs before Yahweh in the tent of the testimony. On the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and brought forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. When Moses brought out all the staffs from before Yahweh to all the people of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his staff, and Yahweh said to Moses, Put the staff of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels that you may make an end of their grumblings against me, lest they die. 
Thus did Moses, as Yahweh commanded him, so he did. And the people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish. We are undone. We are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of Yahweh shall die. Are we all to perish? Now let me deal with that last part of the chapter first. And then we'll go back to the beginning and look at the story. The fear of the Lord grips the congregation at this point. Don't worry, it's just temporary. They will grumble again. But at least at this moment... The fear of Yahweh grips their hearts. They come under profound conviction. The Lord only had to kill 15,000 people over the course of two or three days to accomplish that. But they are struck by the holiness of God. They are struck by the magnitude of their rebellion. And they immediately fear that the Lord will wipe all of them out. Remember, connect what they're saying at the end of chapter 17 with what they said at the beginning of chapter 16. Korah's argument, remember, the three-step argument was all of the people are holy and the Lord dwells in the midst of all the people. Now his conclusion was, therefore it's wrong for Moses and Aaron to be the leaders in the congregation. That was a false conclusion. But his two premises were true. And it's the truth of those two premises that leads to this fear as the people realize, oh no, we are all set apart to God and the Lord dwells in our midst. And maybe that's not such a good thing after all. That there is a casual attitude toward the presence of Yahweh in chapter 16. And when the Lord impresses upon the people His holiness and His presence, they realize, maybe we don't want God in our midst after all. This is going to kill us, right? This is not the first time, and sadly it's not the last time, that they have this experience. It's an intermittent experience. You remember the occasion at Mount Sinai when Yahweh speaks audibly from the mountain and they say to Moses, you go near and let Yahweh speak to you and we will listen to all that He says, but do not let Yahweh speak to us anymore because if we hear Him again, we will die. It's a similar, it's a similar occasion here. Now the reason that that's important is because it introduces chapters 18 and 19 which we are skipping over because we dealt with the contents of those two chapters in our summary of the Mosaic Law. Okay, And so that material, those chapters are referenced in your study guides, and, and even though not every verse is referenced, the content of those two chapters is all summarized in those study guides. So we're skipping over that. But notice, if your Bible has headings, or if you want to just kind of flip through and scan those verses very quickly, you'll notice that the instructions in chapters 18 and 19 pertain to the priesthood, and to the laws of sanctification, the laws of purification. In other words, they answer the question, how can an unholy people have fellowship with a holy God? How can a holy God dwell in the midst of an unholy people? And how can a sinful people be pure in the sight of God? And the answer largely is through atonement mediated by a priest, or priests in this case, and through obedience to God's law of holiness. Now, obviously, that's not a complete answer to that question, is it? Because the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin, and no man by his obedience to the law can be righteous in the sight of God. And so ultimately, even those provisions have to be fulfilled by Christ. Christ is the one. He is the high priest that cleanses a corrupt nation. And that enables a holy God to live at peace in the midst of an unholy people who are now no longer an unholy people. They're now sanctified by the blood of the Lamb. Does that make sense? And so Jesus is the answer to this question. Jesus is the one who brings us near, who cleanses us, who consecrates us, and who enables us to live in fellowship with God and not die so that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So I want you to see that Christological connection. Okay, Now, let's back up and look at the story. This is a fascinating story. It's one of those stories that Old Testament scholars who are skeptical scholars, which most Old Testament scholars it seems like are, most scholars find this very, very frustrating or troubling, or maybe it's mythological, or try and find some kind of naturalistic explanation. Uh, One of the theories that you'll see in commentaries is, well, they cut... Fresh almond limbs. And that's, and that's why they were able to sprout. Really? Sprout and produce buds and blossoms and almonds. No, no. Ripe almonds overnight. This is why I say, if Jesus rose the third day, 
everything else in the Bible is fair game. And if he didn't rise the third day, what are you arguing about blossoming staffs for? I mean, you know, it just doesn't really matter. If, if Jesus rose from the dead, stop being an unbeliever when you come to fantastic stories in the Bible, right? Stop disbelieving the Old Testament if you say you believe the central event in all of human history. On the other hand, if you don't believe the resurrection, stop having an argument with me about the Old Testament miracles, right? Because it doesn't matter anyway. You're lost. You need to repent and trust in Christ. And we'll get to the book of Numbers, right? So it's just a, it's just a silly argument for me. Um, Unfortunately, it's the kind of things that biblical scholars argue about, especially those who are unbelievers. And you'd be astonished how many people make a living as biblical scholars who are unbelievers. Um, the reason I bring that up pretty regularly as we study the Old Testament is I want to make sure that you have clearly in your mind what the real issues are. Fight the right battles. Don't get sidetracked on the wrong hill on the wrong battlefront, right? Your, your task and mine in being salt and light in the midst of an ungodly world is not to convince anyone of the truth of Christianity, but it's certainly not to argue anyone into believing the fantastic miracles in the Old Testament, right? Ultimately, the Holy Spirit's the only one who can bring them to conviction and to faith. If you are going to have an evangelistic or apologetic conversation with someone, let it be about the presuppositions that are leading them to suppress the truth of God that is evident to all, right? Rather than trying to convince them, well, if I could just convince them that the story in Numbers chapter 17 is correct, is true, is historical, then they would believe in Jesus. It's not the way that works, right? Not to burst your bubble, but that's not the way it works. And you're not going to have much success anyway attempting to prove that to someone who doesn't believe in Christ, right? Uh, the story is what it is. It says what it says. You've got 12 staffs, right? One for each tribe and the heads of the father's households, the leaders of each tribe. Remember that there is a Presbyterian government to Israel at this point. Um, the leaders of the, the fathers of each household have, have contributed the staff. They've brought this and one man's name is written on each tribal staff. And Moses takes them in and places them before the testimony, before the ark, before the mercy seat, before the law that is contained in the ark, before the very presence of God. Aaron can't take it in there. Because Aaron only goes into that room once a year on the Day of Atonement. Moses has a higher access. Do you recognize that? Moses is a type of Christ, and his authority is above even the high priest's authority. And so Moses brings them into the very presence of God. The next morning he goes in, he comes back out, and we only have 11 staffs. Because the tribe of Levi's stick is no longer just a staff. It's now a fruitful tree branch overnight. Ripe almonds. Pretty remarkable. Now what, of course, is being said here? Well, the tribe of Levi has been chosen by God. Not just the tribe of Levi. The family of Aaron has been chosen by God. The blessing of God is upon them. That is the fruitful branch. And that language will come up in the prophets, right? With reference to Jesus, who comes not from the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Judah. But you need to see the motif. The fruitful branch, the blessing of God, is upon the leaders that He has ordained over the congregation. And this frightens the people. I mean, they are struck by this. This is one of the reasons I am so skeptical when people want to talk to me about these experiences that they've had. The Lord spoke to me. The Lord appeared to me. An angel came to me. Now, apart from what I consider to be the profound biblical problems with that kind of language or those kind of reports of experiences, one of the, one of the basic uh, problems that I have with that is that every time someone has a close encounter of the divine kind in the Bible, they're terrified. They don't leave comforted. They don't leave warm and fuzzy. Even the most righteous people in the Bible, and the congregation of Israel certainly is not that, but even the most righteous people end up on their faces. I mean, the very words that they use at the end of chapter 17 are, are very similar. It's the same language that Isaiah uses in Isaiah chapter 6 when he is transported, as it were, in a visionary experience into the throne room of God. And he says, woe is me, I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. And arguably, Isaiah is the most righteous man on the face of the earth at that point. 
That's why he's being transported to the throne room of God and commissioned as prophet to the nations, right? Specifically the nation of Judah and Israel. But nonetheless, when people today want to say, well, I saw an angel or the Lord spoke to me, and it was just you know this very comfortable experience. It was a very, it was a very encouraging experience. Do what? Remember them good moral people. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, that's right. And and you know, and what I would say is, you know, just I don't try and talk people out of experiences. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school on on uh, this past Lord's Day. But uh, I don't try and talk people out of experiences. I just try and remind people that God's is not the only voice out there. He's told us how He talks to us. That limit is not imposed upon every other spiritual being out there. Let's turn the page, chapter twenty. Chapter 20, we're only going to focus on the really the first two stories and the very first story, which only occupies one verse, we're going to deal with very, very quickly. There's a chronological issue we need to address here, and then we'll move on. Numbers chapter 20 and verse 1 says, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now you notice what's missing that we have seen in multiple other passages is a reference to what year this is. Now, if we cross-reference and compare, we'll see later in, I believe, chapter 33, that this is, in fact, the 40th year. But we can figure this out already because where are the children of Israel now? They're at Kadesh. Kadesh Barnea. This is where the wilderness wandering Began. It's on the southern border of Canaan proper. It's where they camped when the spies went into the land for 40 days. It's where sentence was pronounced. It's where they went out into the wilderness. They have now come back. This is the end of the wilderness wandering, right? This is the twilight of the wilderness wandering. Or we could say it's the dawn of the invasion and conquest. They're not actually invading and conquering anything yet, but this is now the tail end. But the entire generation is not quite dead yet. Now, you recognize then that when I said we have almost no history of that 38 plus years in the wilderness, I meant it, right? The rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram is the primary story. There are a couple of other snippets in the book of Numbers, but that's the main story in that wilderness period. And beyond that, we just don't have any information other than what we receive in Deuteronomy, which essentially says we moved around a lot, God fed us with manna out of heaven, our clothes didn't wear out, but the generation did. They died. That's what was happening for 39 years. Now, it's year 40. Now the last year of judgment is upon them and now the time of punishment is coming to an end and the time of blessing is about to begin. And interestingly, Miriam is kind of the first of the last to die. She's the first of the last to die. This is the final group of people that are going to die in the wilderness, as it were, and and even though now they are leaving the wilderness by coming to Kadesh, they are really in the wilderness until they cross the Jordan. Right? So at Kadesh, passing through around Edom, passing around Moab, going up the Transjordan and the eastern banks of the Jordan River and then camping on the plains of Moab, all of that's still wilderness. But here now we're going to see the death of the leaders. And Miriam is the first one to die. God preserves her through the entire wilderness wandering. That's, that's remarkable. I don't want to read a lot into that. It's just, it, it is remarkable. Is there any significance to she being the first of that last group? I don't, I don't want to... I think there may be, but I don't want to read too much into it. So I think it's a legitimate question. She's pretty old, you know, because she's at least six years older than Moses. Um, we know that Aaron's three years older. Um, I, I, I don't want to speculate too much. I think that it's appropriate that she's the first one because Aaron needs to be the next to last one because he's the high priest and there's going to be a transition there that's significant and Moses has to be the last one. So I, I guess it just makes sense from that standpoint. Um, but yeah, I think it's really a fascinating question. Um, now, we pick up in verse 2 a story that you probably know and... We may not have anything new here to learn, but I hope that you're going to pay attention because there's some important things to see, even if you've already seen them. Verse 2 of chapter 20, Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. 
And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before Yahweh. Why have you brought the assembly of Yahweh into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of Yahweh appeared to them. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before Yahweh as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels! Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. And Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with Yahweh, and through them he showed himself holy. Now, I want you to turn over to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3 for just a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 3, beginning at verse 23. Chapter 3, chapter three yep, and verse 23. Remember that Deuteronomy are the speeches, the sermons that Moses preaches on the plains of Moab immediately prior to his death. It's the last month prior to the crossing of the Jordan. He says in verse 23, I pleaded with Yahweh at that time, saying, O Lord Yahweh, You have only begun to show Your servant Your greatness and Your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Please, let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. But Yahweh was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. And Yahweh said to me, enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. Go up to the top of Pisgah. And lift up your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes, for you shall not go over this Jordan. But charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he shall go over at the head of this people, and he shall put them in possession of the land you shall see. So we remained in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Now, I want to deal with Deuteronomy 3 here for just a minute and then go back to Numbers 20 and spend the rest of our time tonight. Um, we're not going to teach through the book of Deuteronomy in this Wednesday night class. I've been saying that for uh, a little while. Um, the, I, I love the book of Deuteronomy, um, and, and I'm looking forward to teaching through it, but I just think that it would be better for us to stay with the narrative in this class right now, so we'll skip over it. Um, however, there are things in Deuteronomy that amplify our understanding of this history in the wilderness. This is where we learn the theology of the wilderness, where Moses interprets the experience of the last 40 years and also expounds the law, which is to inform and govern the society of Israel in the land. But what's interesting here uh, are three things, just very, very quickly. First is that Moses, at the end of his life, having walked with the Lord longer than any of us ever will in this life, right? I don't know, maybe someone here will live to 120. So it's unlikely, right? Having walked with the Lord a long time, Moses says, you have only begun to show to me and to us how great you are, right? You've only begun to show us your greatness, your might, your acts, your power. And Moses wants to go into the promised land not just because he would like retirement, you know, and who wouldn't after the last 40 years, right? He, he would like to finish his course and then maybe 
go play golf or you know do something. And no, he's going to finish his work and die. That's not bad, by the way. He goes to his reward, and his reward is not in Canaan. It's with the Lord, right? But he wants to go into Canaan not for apparently material purposes, but for theological ones. He says, I've only started seeing who you are. Now, this is the man who just a couple of weeks ago we saw Yahweh spoke and identified Moses as like Yahweh's friend. He says, when I speak to a prophet, I speak to him dimly in dark sayings, dreams, and visions. When I speak to Moses, I speak as a man speaks to his friend, face to face. This is the man who is the meekest man on the face of the entire earth. This is a man who is the typical prophet of the Messiah. Typical in the formal sense. He's typological, right? When, when we talk about the prophet who is to come, the Messiah, the ultimate spokesman of God, the Word of God, Deuteronomy chapter 18 identifies him with Moses. The Lord your God will raise up from among your brethren a prophet like me. The Christ will be like Moses. He will be the new Moses. And in fact, that is a central emphasis in the Gospel of Matthew. You notice that the Gospel of Matthew parallels Jesus' story with Israel's story, and Moses in particular. And Matthew begins Jesus' teaching ministry by having Jesus go up on a mountain and deliver the law. That's not a coincidence, right? This is a special guy. And at the end of all of that, Moses says, I, I've scratched the surface. I have, I've only begun to see the greatness and the glory of God. Now, that, that should be impressive to us. That should give some perspective to us, and that should be humbling to us. Because no matter how much we think we have seen, no matter how much we think we know, I can assure you, the Lord would not say of Joel Ellis, he is the meekest man on the face of the earth. I am sure that the Lord would not say, when I talk to all of those other guys, I talk to them in dark saints. But when I talk to Joel, I talk to him as a, as a man talks to his friend. Now, see, none of us belong in this category with Moses. Moses is in a category by himself. And Moses, at the end of 120 years of relationship with Yahweh, says, I have just touched the hem of the garment, and Lord, I want to see more. Of course, now we have a more developed understanding of what is to come. And so this is actually the reason I want to die, is because, Lord, I want to see more. Right? That's what we long for. The reason we want to go to heaven is because Christ is there. And we want to see Him. We want to be with Him where He is. Don't want heaven for materialistic reasons. Right? That's not why Moses wants to go into Canaan. You see the parallel? Canaan is the land of rest. But it's not our land of rest. It's typological. It's pointing us ahead to the land of rest that God has prepared for those who love Him. But you know what makes that place special? Is that you get to see more of God than you saw here. You get to see more of God in the land of rest than you will ever see in the wilderness. And we should long for that. We should long for that. That's the first thing. The second thing is in verse 26. Moses says, The Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. Now, without context and without theological reflection, that sounds a little petty, doesn't it? Right? Moses is saying, God was mad at me because of you. Um, wait, you're the one that hit the rock, right? Israel didn't do that. You did that. But I think there's something more here that we need to see. And that is, I think Moses is speaking out of the reality of his identification with the Exodus generation. In other words, God's judgment against Moses was because of Moses' unbelief in Numbers 20. And yet it was part and parcel of a much larger experience of the Exodus generation. Moses was not going to go into the promised land. Because in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, when God pronounces sentence, He says only Caleb and Joshua 
Now, truthfully, Eliezer and Phineas are in there as well. I teased you with that. Hopefully, by now, you found that. The Levites are not included in the census, so the priests go in. Okay, And so, theoretically, Moses could have been included in that because, after all, he's a Levite, son of Kohath, brother of Aaron. But the reality is, Moses was never going to go into the Promised Land because he is part of the Exodus generation. Was he guilty of their sins and errors in the wilderness? No. But he shares in suffering with his people. He identifies with them in their suffering. And he dies with them, as it were. He's the last one. He's the last one. And he dies in sight of the promise. But he only sees it. He does not enter into it. He does not experience it. So I I don't take Moses here in some kind of a self-pitying fashion blaming the Israelites for his error. I don't think that's what he's doing. I don't think he's denying his error at all. I think what he's recognizing and affirming is I'm part of your father's generation, not part of yours. I'm part of that group that came out of Egypt and saw the wonders of God and fell in the wilderness due to what? Unbelief. Hebrews 3 and 4. What is Moses' sin back in Numbers chapter 20? Unbelief. That's going to be important. We'll come back to that in just a second. Does that make sense? And then notice the mercy of God in the midst of wrath. That's the third point. The mercy of God in the midst of judging His servant Moses. As great a servant of God as Moses is, God can still tell Moses no. And He can say that to you too. So don't pray to God and then be offended when He says no to your prayer. He's got that right. He's God, right? And He's told greater men than you or me, no. He has that right. Paul pleads with Him three times about the thorn in the flesh. God says, no. I let Satan put that there for a reason. It's for your good. And Moses pleads with God, let me go into the promised land. And the Lord says, don't ask me that again. I've had to tell that to my children before, right? I already answered that. Don't ask me that again. God's probably had to say that to me sometimes, right? God has the right to say no. And yet, even as He says no, what does He do? Go up to the top of Pisgah. Look around. All around. I'm giving it to all of them. I'm giving it to your people, Moses. You, by God's grace, with the help of the Spirit, you arrived. You got them there. And you die within sight of it. Praise God. Moses is like David. Paul says in Acts chapter 13 and verse 36 that David served the purpose of God in his generation and then he fell asleep. And that is what Moses did. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what David did. That's what Jeremiah did. None of those men experienced the blessings that they wanted to see. Jeremiah did not want to go to Egypt. That's where he dies. John the Baptist did not want to die in prison. That's where he dies. Moses does not want to die on the top of Mount Pisgah. That's where he dies. David does not want to die knowing that many of his sons are going to hell because they're a bunch of unbelievers and wretches. But that's how he dies. None of them experienced the full promises and blessings that they had hoped to experience. Every single one of them experienced or, or served rather the purpose of God in their generation. And then they fell asleep. And that is a good thing. Praise God. Do not dictate to God what you think the plan for your life ought to be. Be content with what He's appointed and be faithful where you are. That's, that's the challenge for all of us, right? Okay, does that make sense? Okay, preaching a lot here, sorry. Okay, so let's go back to Numbers chapter 20. Let's look at this story. Of course, the sin is obvious, right? God says, speak to the rock. Moses hits the rock. Now, yes, yes. I'm about to dig a little deeper than that, and some of you know where I'm going with this, but don't dig so deep that you forget where we started. Moses disobeyed what God said. That's wrong. Disobedience is wrong. Now, his, his disobedience is bigger than just hitting the rock when God said, speak to the rock. Okay? This is bigger than just a simple mistake in terms of method. But there is an error in terms of method, and that's important, right? I mean, a few generations from now... David's going to get this great idea to move the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. They're going to put it on a brand new cart being pulled by oxen. And when the oxen stumble and the Ark tips, Uzzah reaches up and steadies the Ark and dies for it. He pays a price. 
for a methodological error. God takes methodological errors pretty seriously. But there's more than that. What is this? When God says, speak to the rock, and Moses hits the rock, what is this? God says it's unbelief. It's unbelief. Now, we talked about this earlier in the Pentateuch. And again, I would encourage you, go home and read Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. Because this is the very theme that the Hebrews writer is expounding and unpacking. He's preaching in that part of the sermon. I think the book of Hebrews is a sermon. He's preaching in that part of the sermon about, uh, about Psalm 95. Well, guess what Psalm 95 is about? The rebellion in the wilderness. Right? So he's preaching about the book of Numbers. He's just doing it through the Psalter. And, and what he says is that their disobedience in the wilderness was unbelief. That's why they die. That's why they fall. And that's why Moses falls. Now, you say, that's a pretty frightening thing because if Moses is an unbeliever, then Moses is lost. Well, no. That's not what we're saying. It's not that kind of unbelief. He's not renouncing Yahweh, right? He's not an apostate. And yet what we re need to realize is that disobedience to God's Word is an act of unbelief. I've told you before about the sign that uh, the, the church that was close to my house in Mississippi where we lived for eight years, there was a, there was a church right around the corner that had a changeable marquee. And they had a, some pretty decent messages over those eight years, but there is one, only one, that has stayed in my mind all, of, all the years since. And that was, many people believe in God, few people believe God. Well, that was great. Many people believe in God, few people believe God when He speaks they don't believe His Word. They don't trust Him. They believe that He's there. They don't trust Him. Wes? I'm trying to be like praying and, and really not thinking that He's going to answer your prayer. That could be an, an example of it. That's right. That's right. But even, even I mean, uh, yeah, well, I don't want to unpack this, but there's so many examples of this. But you think about how the church does not believe God when we do not content ourselves with what He said in His Word. We need to improve it some way. You know, we need to find some other means of growing the church or strengthening the church, whatever it is. You're not believing God. Well, of course we believe in God. No, you're not. You're not trusting Him. He said, do this and He'll provide the blessing. It's not your purpose to manufacture the blessing. Now, it's worse than that. Notice what Moses says, verse 10. Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Sounds a little presumptive. Now, I want to be fair. I want to be fair. Verse 8, the Lord had said to him, So by doing this, you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give them drink. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to read too much into it because I want to be fair. But is there not seemingly at least an element of pride in what Moses says? In Moses and Aaron standing up before the, the people... And, and they are standing there, not as representatives of Yahweh now, but they are standing there. Why do you think this happened? I want you to think about that seriously for a minute, because I think there's actually an answer to this. It, it, it may be reading between the lines a little bit. We don't want to be too dogmatic, but, but it seems fairly obvious why this happens. And it's even hinted at, I think, in that passage in Deuteronomy 3, where Moses says, the Lord was angry with me because of you. Angry with me because of you... What provokes Moses to say and do this, David? In Genesis chapter 11, an indicator of the fallenness of man, yes. all in one place, they say we want to make a name for ourselves. That's what sin always is an attempt to do, isn't it? Right. right? It's I'm put, putting myself in the place of God. I'm putting my wisdom in place of God's wisdom. I'm putting my wishes, my desires in place of God's desire. I am God. That's what I'm saying when I sin. That's why we say all sin is rooted in pride and selfishness. All sin is an act of pride and selfishness, right? Either explicitly, overtly, or implicitly. Why do you think Moses falls into this, Nancy? It just comes to me, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. First, first Samuel 15. This is Samuel's uh, announcement to King Saul, right? King Saul says, well, you know, okay... We saved the best of the animals. But we did that for sacrifice. God doesn't want sacrifice. If God wants a sacrifice, He'll tell you He wants a sacrifice. God does not want creative disciples. He wants faithful disciples. Do you know how radical that is in American culture? Where we pride creativity and innovation above all? 
And creativity and innovation is a beautiful thing when it's technology, when it's artwork, when it's an entrepreneur. It's an awful thing in the church. You don't want a creative, innovative leader in the church. You don't want a creative, innovative congregation. You want a faithful church that is profoundly uncreative. <laughs> right? And just as content with what God has said. I think the reason Moses falls into this is because the people provoke him. I think he is proud. I think he is angry. I think he is frustrated. I think he is burned out. And I think he shoots off at the mouth. And of course, I've never done this. I'm sure you've never done this, right? No, we do this. We do this. Some of us a lot. I mean, this is same song, 40th year that it's been playing on repeat. Change the channel, folks, right? What are they saying at the beginning of the story? Verse 3, would that we had perished when our brothers perished before Yahweh. And I'm thinking at that point, Moses and Aaron are saying, Amen. <laughs> would that you had. I wish you had. Why don't you now? Right? He is sick and tired. Of it. It's the same thing. Verse 4, why have you brought the assembly of Yahweh into this wilderness that we should die here both? I mean, can they not come up with something else? Forty years of hearing this. Why does Moses say, the Lord was angry with me because of you? I already suggested the first reason. It's corporate solidarity in the wilderness generation. It's the sin of this people. Moses is part of the Exodus generation, not the invasion generation. But this is the second reason. It's a much simpler one. <laughs> I think God got angry with Moses because Moses got angry with the people and it was the people's stupidity and unbelief that prompted Moses to do something fatal. Right, Jim? Another thought popped in my mind as you're talking about that. Um, Moses was under constant pressure. Absolutely. Rebellion and stuff. I mean, all God had to do was let him go one day and he'd, he'd pull something. Sure. And I think there's a reason. I don't think God wanted Moses in Israel. And when I'm saying this, I'm saying it was time to turn that page. They were going into the promised land. Clearly. After Joshua and Caleb to take over. Correct. And how are they going to take over if Moses is hanging around? Moses cannot sin unless God allows it. Right. I think, so, that's, I think that's exactly right. I think God, but because I think in, in Numbers 13 and 14, it's pretty clearly implied Moses is not going in. Right. And yet the sentence that confirms that isn't until Numbers 20. And I think that God is allowing the circumstance to un, un, trans. Trans unform, whatever, transpire. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Lee. I think it goes even another step farther. Okay. That vein. Here's a man that for 40 years has been the epitome of that generation. Yeah. He has been a part of that. He's protected them. Sure. He's gone back to them and finally he's reached the point where he's had enough. Yeah. And he says, You rebels. My reading of that, he is separating himself. From yeah, people. I think that's correct. I think he is setting himself there apart from the people. Is yeah, a sin. that's correct. Is that, that is a sin. No, really Absolutely, happen. that is a sin. Absolutely, no doubt, Margie. I think early on, you told us to watch for how many times they grumbled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a lot. It's a lot. And now, we have the same problem. absolutely. Now. I want you to think about this. I'm, I'm going to make real quick because I've got one more point we need to go over. A um, little pastoral application. I preach to myself here while I preach to you. Um, you need to be aware of, of the danger of this. You need to be aware of the danger of this with your brothers, sisters, spouse, kids, grandkids. Also be hyper aware of the danger to yourself in falling into this, right? I, I come home stressed out with some problem in the church and my kids pay the penalty for that, right? Or my wife pays the penalty for that. And, and it's the stress of this situation that prompts my sin, right? Moses is blameless in this grumbling about water. But guess what? The people's sin in that situation leads to Moses' sin in responding to it. And you and I have got to be hyper aware of the danger of righteousness in a given moment becoming self-righteousness. 
right? Of stress in a particular situation leading to more sin. That's what the devil loves. So why in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 does Paul say what he says? He says, if any of you is overtaken in a trespass, let those who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, each one looking to yourself, lest you also be tempted. That's this story. This story is an example of how not to do that. Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring forth water from you out of this rock? It's not even that I think so much that he's claiming credit for the power to do that. But as Lee pointed out, he's separating himself from the people. He's setting himself over the people. And he's clearly done with the people. And the Lord says, you didn't believe me. You did not trust me. And what is the reality of that? This is the last point and we go home. Verse 12, you did not believe me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. Obedience, simple, humble obedience is an act of trust that hallows the name of God. Every day, if you pray the Lord's Prayer every day, I don't know, maybe you don't, but if every time you pray the Lord's Prayer and you say, hallowed be thy name, recognize what you are committing yourself to. Because you cannot say, hallowed be your name, and then go smack that rock when God said, speak to it. Or, or set yourself up over the nation as if you are somehow apart from them. Remember the fall and go the serpent. You could be like God. Exactly. God is no longer separate. God is no longer transcendent. God is no longer holy. We've collapsed the creator-creature distinction. And that's what sin does. Or is that, that's what sin aspires to do. It doesn't succeed, does it? When we don't believe God... And when that unbelief is manifest in acts of disobedience, attitudes and actions of disobedience are themselves acts and attitudes of unbelief, and that is not treating God as holy. Go back for just a minute. Leviticus chapter 10. We made this point weeks ago with Nadab and Abihu. But I told you, it's, I think I told you, I hope I remembered to tell you, it's not the last time you'll see this connection. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what Yahweh has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. What is he saying? I will be hallowed. I will be treated as holy. I will, I will be. It's not that you ought to. I will be. God is hallowed that day by burning them to death. Right? But notice what else he says. Before all the people, I will be glorified. Now, God's going to be glorified either by judging us or by saving us. God is going to be hallowed in wrath or in mercy. But he's going to be holy either way. And what does Moses, or what does the Lord rather say to Moses in Numbers 20? He says, by not believing in me, you did not treat me as holy before the people. You did not sanctify me. You did not hallow me in the eyes of all the people. And therefore, you will not bring this assembly into the land. And you need to see the doctrine of providence here. Jim brought, brought this up. Moses is not going to go into the land. Do you know why he's not going to go in the land? Because God loosens the restraining grace and allows him to fall here. And we are that dependent on God's grace. Right? And if we remember that, then we will want to hallow him. In all that we say, in all that we do, and how, how we think, we will fall short of that daily but it doesn't change the reality of the standard and the call to be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And our lives, our attitudes, our actions should manifest that we know that He is holy and we want to treat Him as such. Right? And the way that we do that, trust and obey. Right? You trust Him. You obey Him. You simply be faithful. And that's what Moses fails to do here. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's bow and pray. 
Our God and Father, we're thankful indeed for the blessing of this time of study. We're thankful, O oh God, for your servant Moses. We learn so much from his life, from his work, from his great sufferings for you, from his faithfulness, and even, Lord, in the passage that was before us tonight, in his unfaithfulness. God, we're thankful that you are merciful in the midst of judgment. That even when you discipline your children, you nevertheless love them and continue to call them your own. And we're thankful, O oh God, that you showed mercy to your servant Moses, that you drew him into an eternal blessedness and peace at his death, and that he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with our Lord Jesus to speak of Jesus' own exodus that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. We're thankful for the hope that we have for all of your saints who are saved by grace. And yet, God, tonight in the passage that was before us, we are reminded and, and, and made to think soberly about the demands of your holiness, the demands of your word, and are reminded, O oh God, that we are to be a faithful people, a people that believe you, and a people that hallow you before all men. Help us to do so. Forgive us when we fail, for we fall short of the glory of the most holy God every day in more ways than we know. We know our sin, Father, and we are grieved over it. And yet we pray that you would strengthen us, that you would bless us and help us. Not only forgive us, God, but strengthen and transform our hearts so that we might be conformed into the likeness of your Son, who was faithful even where Moses was unfaithful, who provided living water by the power of his voice and who was struck for our sin so that we might be saved. Thank you, O oh God, for the gospel. It is our hope and our peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.